Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a ruling today in a controversial last-minute decision by former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. It involves a killing in San Diego. And a search for missing women in Tijuana crosses the border thanks to social media. And while hate crimes are said to be down in California, several hate groups claim San Diego is home, especially in the music scene. More on who they are in just a few minutes. Plus, with just two months before the election, San Diego mayoral candidates say they've changed their minds on several key issues. And the candidates got grilled today by some young constituents. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Eric Anderson in for Dwayne Brown. A judge says that former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger did not break the law by cutting the sentence of Esteban Nunez, the son of a political ally in prison for killing a man in San Diego. Today's ruling came in a lawsuit filed by San Diego District Attorney and the family of the victim, Mesa College student Luis Santos. Nunez was sentenced to 16 years for manslaughter. Hours before leaving office, Schwarzenegger cut the sentence to seven years. The DA and the victim's family say that was against the law. The judge disagreed, saying it was distasteful and repugnant, but not illegal. District Attorney Bonnie DeManis says she will appeal. Activists are planning to march in Tijuana tomorrow, trying to draw attention to the disappearance of young women in Baja, California. The cases are getting publicized on social media. The online posts say the university-aged women are being kidnapped for the slave trade. The bodies of two women were found in Encinada this week. A third has been reported missing in Tijuana. Police say the cases are not related. Tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of San Diego's big blackout. Despite an eight-month inquiry into what caused the outage, KPBS reporter Amitha Sharma says a central question remains unanswered. The lights went out a little after 3.30 p.m. on September 8th, which was on one of the hottest days last year. The outage happened after a utility worker in Arizona tripped off an electric transmission line. Now, there are safeguards within the system that should have been able to isolate the problem, but they didn't kick in. So the initial trip off cascaded through the system, causing a blackout. Parts of Orange County, Riverside County were affected. All of San Diego and Imperial counties were affected and parts of Baja California were affected. Um, the blackout ended up shutting down the lights for about 3 million people. Schools shut down in San Diego, businesses closed, gas stations closed, traffic lights stopped working causing bottlenecks on roads and freeways and millions of gallons of raw sewage flowed into rivers in both the San Diego and Baja regions. People had to roll out the emergency plans. They were eating by candlelight. After an eight-month inquiry, federal regulators blamed the blackout on poor planning and inadequate communication and lack of awareness by utilities of what was going on on their part of the grid. Regulators also said the blackout could have been prevented had there been more local power generation, but they didn't say, they never answered why there wasn't more local power generation. Meanwhile, San Diego Gas and Electric says it will not pay the claims filed by 7,000 of its customers for $7 million in losses due to the blackout. The company says it didn't cause the blackout, and so it should not have to pay those costs. KPBS reporter Amitha Sharma, since the blackout, San Diego invested $17 million in seven new backup generators for its sewage pumps. San Diego now has state approval to expand a regional enterprise zone to try to create new jobs. Businesses get tax incentives by moving into enterprise zones. The San Diego regional zone already covers a large area of the South Bay, and now it's growing to include parts of Kearney Mesa, Mira Mesa, and Rancho Bernardo. 
The region's housing market is starting to improve a bit, and that was welcome news to the region's realtors who gathered today in Mission Valley. The signs of recovery are modest but steady. Home prices in San Diego are nowhere near pre-recession levels, but real estate tracking firm DataClick says the average price rose to a four-year high in July. Those are encouraging numbers for Lawrence Yun, the chief economist for the National Association of Realtors. But right now, the economy in the manufacturing sector uh, is still shaky. Uh, but now that the housing is beginning to recover, uh, that is beginning to create jobs uh, in many sectors. Yun says the fundamentals that support the housing market are moving in the right direction. Uh, jobs are being created, the mortgage rates are exceptionally low, uh, then you have the rents increasing, uh, generally means that some of the renters want to pull out a calculator and see if it makes more sense to buy a home. And while there are homes on the market here in San Diego, as you can see, there are not as many homes as there used to be on the market. And all those distressed properties, the foreclosures, not out there as much. Over half of the homes sold uh, in California right now uh, in the short sale arena and in the uh, REO arena are multiple offers with three, four, five, um, many multiple offers. So again, you get a very tight inventory, great lending environment, uh, all cash demand. Leslie Appleton Young says the competition for homes and a shrinking inventory of short sales and foreclosures are working together to push prices up. But not everything is positive, however. Realtors are worried that a slumping job market could hurt housing, and they say that mortgages are still difficult to get. That could complicate a housing recovery. It is 60 days to Election Day, and the recent series of mayoral debates reveal the candidates have changed their minds about several issues. Peggy Pico has the details. San Diego mayoral candidates Bob Filner and Carl DeMaio seem to have softened their attitudes toward each other and embraced new positions in recent debates. Voice of San Diego reporter Liam Dillon has covered the mayor's race since it started and joins me to break down those changes by the candidates. Liam, both candidates seem to be behaving somewhat differently toward each other. What have you actually noticed? Well, it's not so much that they're behaving differently towards each other. It's that the image they're trying to present to voters, you know, um, to take a step back. I mean, San Diego is used to electing sort of moderate, very kind of folksy sort of mayors, folks that aren't as not nearly as partisan as these two guys. And so they're trying to, you know, to be mayor, present an image that is like the mayors in the past um, and, and try to sort of sell the idea that they can be just as moderate or, or just a, or an image of the kind of mayor that San Diego likes to elect. But there has been some actual changes specifically changes. Let's start with uh, Carl DeMaio, for instance, on education. He's changed on that. Tell us about that. Well, he used to say that uh, the city had too many problems, financial and otherwise, to deal with education. The uh, city of San Diego does not have any direct control over the uh, city schools or really any schools. It's a separately run organization by uh, managed by a school board. And so uh, now he says, though, he wants to have more involvement uh, from the city. He's uh, championing a joint city council school board meeting uh, uh, this month. Um, he wants to sort of uh, promote some performance standards and is very much now talking about education as something that will be under his purview, where in the past he said he, the city wouldn't have time to deal with it. And there's a few other things, too. Sewage, uh, what Sewage else? recycling, yeah, two years ago. I mean, there's sort of this massive project going on right now to uh, know that it was it used to be derided as toilet the tap. Uh, that's not really dis discussed so much anymore. Um, but the process by which, you know, wastewater is recycled into, into drinking water, uh, Carl was opposed to that at a vote two years ago and sort of moderated step by step. Uh, and now he calls it in his environmental plan, which she released uh, a couple weeks ago, a trusted technology, which is very, very different from what he used to say in the past. Absolutely. And the border development, and also uh, he's, he's switched on that a little bit, wants to be more involved. Right. But also the downtown business. Tell me about that. That's yeah, his, the, his biggest sort of, one. The, the sort of the biggest thing for me is, ch again, the change in rhetoric. Um, and I think this is the the place where we've seen him change his rhetoric the most. It's not just downtown folks, but sort of there the most. He's traditionally blamed for the time that he's been in San Diego, as recently in the primary, two groups for the San Diego's financial problems, government labor unions and what a group he calls downtown insiders, right? Um, and so he now is uh, sort of courting some of the downtown business leaders and groups that he traditionally criticized in the past to help donate to his campaign or be a part of his campaign, and they are receptive to that. And so that's definitely a difference in softening his rhetoric towards them. Similarly, I mean, I mentioned the pension uh, issues. He's railed against that ever since he mm. got here. Um, used to say that folks who were involved in making those decisions 
didn't have any political future, didn't deserve any political future. Tony Atkins, uh, now an assembly member, was a council member when she was uh, a few years ago during the pension. Uh, now, when she was named the majority leader in the uh, assembly, he now congratulated her. So it's a great development for San Diego. It, Very different. Definitely different. Let's talk about uh, Bob Filner. Yes. What are, has been his top sort of turnaround? Well, he, uh, in the primary, emphasized his opposition to three big things. The Proposition B pension initiative, which is, you know, 401ks for most new hires. Uh, the financing plan for the convention center expansion, uh, and also the plan to remodel uh, the, the Plaza de Panama and Balboa Park. And he decried them in the strongest terms. They were a fraud. They were a giveaway. Right. You know, and now he says, well, uh, I might not like them, but I'm going to implement them now. Uh, and, and that's sort of different, he, again, sort of a conciliatory tone that he really hasn't taken when he was really bellicose about them in the primary. So despite these changes, do you think this is really a political ploy to get elected? Or, or do you think they're really genuinely trying to move toward the middle because of the feedback they've heard from people? Well, I think, you know, you're going to see in every election, right? You're going to see candidates run to the extremes in the primary, and they're going to see candidates move to the middle in the, in the general. And I don't think it's any different than, than, uh, than any other election. Although there is sort of a, the amount of shifting going on here is, is sort of, seems to me to be kind of unprecedented uh, in, in terms of what these folks are doing. If you do spend a lot of time, though, looking at their, at their history and their backgrounds, you know, like I've tried to do, um, you'll see that the sort of the move to the middle is pretty out of character. Uh, for what they've done in the past. And so if you believe that history repeats itself, you're more likely to see some of these guys act uh, like they did in the primary than what they're acting like now. We only have a time for two more questions. Yeah. 20 debates are planned between Labor Day and election time. Why yeah. so many? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know. I think it's kind of overkill. I mean, I, but I understand it from the candidate's, candidate's perspective. You have an interest group says, hey, come talk to me. And they don't want to upset an interest group, particularly in a close election like this where every vote is going to count. Um, they have to show up. And so, you know, fortunately, um, that does allow these interest groups and folks to kind of see everybody's positions, but it, it is hard on them, and I, I don't envy their position on this. They're saying yes to everybody. Exactly. Very briefly before we go, is endorsements. Uh, who's backing whom? Uh, Carl announced this week that uh, Jan Goldsmith was backing him as a city attorney. Um, that's sort of the only new one. Basically, everything else is what you would expect. A lot of Republicans lining up for Carl. A lot of Democrats lining up for Bob. Um, I think the two big outstanding ones that are out there, current Mayor, Republican Mayor Jerry Sanders has not endorsed, and Assemblyman Nathan Fletcher, who was a candidate in the primary, also hasn't endorsed. Uh, they've both made in entreaties to both, and we'll see who, who they uh, line up with. We'll see what happens. Liam Dillon, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Peggy. Now, those mayoral candidates went back to school today, and as KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr shows us, they got their feet held to the fire with some tough questioning. Today's event had all the earmarks of a classic political debate. There were the stately candidates, the dignified backdrop, and the assembled media. But there was something noticeably different about this debate. I'd like to welcome you all to the 2012 San Diego mayoral debates. It was being run by teenagers, and these teenagers knew what they were talking about. For instance, here's La Jolla Country Day senior Alex Garcia asking Councilman Carl DeMaio and Congressman Bob Filner about the city's decision to transfer booking responsibilities for the public convention center to the private convention and visitors bureau. Uh, how would you prevent a repeat of the spending abuses and poor management policies that were the reason the city took booking power for the convention center away from the bureau in 2004. Today's debate was the result of months of hard work by students from the Proy School and La Jolla Country Day. They did research, worked with journalists, and crafted questions designed to put San Diego's mayoral candidates on the spot. We were there last week when they were planning their approach. We are all ready. Now all that's missing is you. Preparations for the debate initially began last spring when students got the commitment of the mayoral campaigns. Work picked up again just two days after the new school year began when government teacher Jonathan Schulman brainstormed with his seniors about the issues they might want to bring up. Pension reform. Absolutely. What else? Uh, labor unions. Labor unions. The kids enthusiastically offered up ideas from the convention center expansion to outsourcing city services. Senior Jessica Lewis wants to hear a discussion about a subject that plays a major role in her life. I think I'd personally want to hear the most about education. Even though I know they're limited on what they can do, I'm curious to hear what they see in the future for San Diego schools. Our city's debt and how we're going to repay it. Alex Garcia wants to focus on the future as well. I hope they'll give us a plan for not just the short term and their prospects right now, but for San Diego long term since, you know, we're young and we are thinking of probably like 
coming back to San Diego probably after college or if we stay in San Diego for college, we really are invested in the future of San Diego, so we probably want more of a longer term focus. Amir Ferry says the candidate should remember that some of the students creating the questions will also be casting the ballot in November. Well, this year is actually, I feel it's like my political awakening. It's my first year I'll be able to vote. So I've been following national elections, you know, congressional elections. And I think it's really important to follow your local politics and the mayoral office. So I really hope to get a greater understanding of that. Public transportation. Public transportation. Jonathan Schulman wants his students to have a better understanding, too. His classes have had local college professors and political pundits as guest speakers, and he says the debate fits right into his curriculum. One of the things that I'm always trying to push with the students is civic engagement and find any opportunity uh, for them to uh, not just read about it, not just watch it, but participate in it. Schulman says these kids are determined to get some real answers out of the candidates. One of the things that we've been talking about and that the advantage that the students have um, is that the students are not journalists. They can hold the candidates' feet to the fire in a way that journalists can't. Um, journalists need to be able to maintain that relationship and keep access or, or you can't do your job. And the students here, um, they've got a, you know, a one shot at it. And the students took that shot today, peppering Filner and DeMaio with questions ranging from public safety to border issues to the pension. The candidates each offered their congratulations on a job well done. And at the end, there was a job offer from Filner. Well, thank you and thank you students. And by the way, whichever candidate you like, I'm sure I could speak for Carl, we can offer you internships in our campaigns. <laughs> California Attorney General Kamala Harris recently announced hate crimes are down slightly in California. Peggy Pico takes an in-depth look at hate groups who call San Diego home. Four Camp Pendleton Marines accused of beating a man unconscious at an LGBT bar in Long Beach on Labor Day could be charged with a hate crime. There's also the recent killing spree at a Sikh temple in Wisconsin by a former leader of a white supremacist metal band. Here with details on local hate groups and their music scene is reporter Dave Moss of San Diego City Beat. Dave, let's start with the Attorney General's recent report that said that hate crimes are down in California. Is that a significant decrease? No, no, it's only about 4%, which still sounds pretty good, but it really is with only, you know, maybe a few dozen. And if you look at San Diego County, 2010, the FBI recorded something like around 120. The, you know, Attorney General had 112. So it, it really is just, you know, it varies a little bit. I don't think it's a significant decrease. There were some specifics as far as this report says. They found the most common type of hate crime in the state is based on race, ethnicity, national origin, and hate crimes against blacks, they found, were accounting for nearly a third of the total reported. But anti-Hispanic crimes were down about 43%. Is there any reason that you discovered for that? Are they saying there's any reason for that? It was a really surprising number, and, and I, I don't know that anybody's come to me with, a, with an idea of what the change is. I mean, it could be people reporting it less. It could be that there's more acceptance in our society, which I'm sure we'd like to believe. But really, I, I don't have a very good answer for that. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't able to find any either with the report, so it's an interesting. We'll have to keep our eye on that. You've done a lot of reporting on hate crime groups in San Diego, specifically uh, music groups here. Tell me a little bit about those white supremacist groups here in San Diego. Well, in July, at the end of July, uh, El Cajon hosted one of the most significant uh, white supremacist concerts in the country. It was put on by a group called the Hammerskin Nation or Western Hammerskins or uh, Crew 38. They all use different names, but they're essentially the same group. And uh, a, a record label, label called Antipathy Records, which continues to sell the same as some of the same recordings by Wade Page, who was involved in the, the Sikh shooting. Uh, it was a huge event, went totally under the radar. Uh, I don't think anybody reported on it until we did, which was more, probably more than a month after the fact. 
Police knew about it. Uh, they found out about it kind of mm -hmm. on the sly, right? Somebody notified them. Yeah, you know, uh, typically the, the white supremacists keep this under wraps, and they don't announce the location until just before. And the FBI and the Anti-Defamation League and police tend to have, you know, uh, fake accounts and that sort of thing. So somebody was clearly tipped off right before it. They alerted El Cajon police right before it, and they did have a presence outside uh, the VFW hall in El Cajon uh, just to make sure everything uh, didn't get out of hand. What about some of the other uh, white supremacist groups, Max Resist, White Knuckle Drive? What, what are some of the other groups that well, were Well, those are the here? three bands there. There was Max Resist, uh, Chaos 88, I think is the band, and uh, um, White Knuckle Driver, as you said. Uh, and Max Resist is perhaps one of the most uh, prominent uh, skinhead bands in the country. And that band, uh, Wade Page, actually did uh, substitute in for other band members from time to time. So these concerts are protected by free speech. Is there anything law enforcement can do? I mean, uh, are they inciting violence? And they, can they get them on anything? I think it's pretty much just a First Amendment issue. I think I think they, you know, the police tend to let them do their thing as long as it doesn't cross that line. And similar to that, you would see with the uh, you know the Westboro you know Baptist Church or any other kind of groups that are you know maybe they're their politics you know disturb people but as long as they don't cross over the line into violence then maybe not but they do monitor them they do make sure because these things do eventually i mean people do eventually you know i mean things do happen i i, I don't want to paint a group with anything but you know wade page is a good example um does law enforcement here in san diego county have a specific detail or a specific group that sort of monitors the uh going ons of these groups i believe i believe there is i believe that i mean the fbi definitely i would say is the go-to agency on a lot of this stuff the da's office does take a look at it especially with lgbt issues and that's uh, a lot of lgbt related hate crimes you, you do see them i mean i think in san diego county that was the the largest number of of hate related crimes and i think i think there's a lot of sensitivity in san diego because of that Last question is, um, if somebody is convicted of a hate crime, what sort of additional penalties do they face because it is actually a hate crime in addition to whatever else it was? I, I couldn't tell you the exact aggravating thing, but it is an aggravating factor. It can, uh, you know, if you if you have a, you know, a violence conviction, you can amplify the sentence, you know, based on, you know, a hate crime. But they are very, very difficult to prove. I mean, you have to essentially prove somebody's motivation for a crime. And that's, you know, getting inside somebody's head is a difficult thing to prove in a court of law. All right, David Moss, thanks so much for talking with us. Oh, thank you. San Diego's Little Saigon is a cluster of more than 100 Vietnamese-owned businesses along El Cajon Boulevard. It serves a lot of local families, but so far, not a common destination for trend-setting consumers with disposable incomes. People in the area say the issue and solution is literally street level. We started the business outside our apartment at the time in 1990. A couple years later, my mom saved up enough money to start the business, a little tiny restaurant, like serving uh, Vietnamese food. The Little Saigon District, which is a rather new initiative, but what makes it unique is that between Highland and Euclid, which is about five blocks, there's about 120 businesses and 90% or so are Vietnamese owned. El Cajon Boulevard between Park and 54th is like four to five miles. It's a very long stretch. So we have to recognize where in that long business district there are clusters of businesses and address their needs within there because those are the places where people exist and they're more apt to use multi forms of transportation. Fixing the front of the facade shows that you care and it, it definitely will bring people in because it's, you know, the first thing that people see. At the old location, we did have one tree, but it got taken down. It actually hurt our business. It didn't look as appealing to the outside public because it created more of an industrial look. What you want is a friendly, inviting area, like a park. Outside here, we have a very sloped, cracked sidewalk, and so it makes it hard as we're looking to get a, a public right-of-way to do outdoor seating makes it hard to place those items out there and really take over and expand onto the sidewalk. El Cajon Boulevard really is an in-city highway. Businesses that aren't on a stoplight often have trouble with people if they're on the other side of the street. How do I get over there? Say that someone needs to park across the street. 
they have to cross several lanes of fast moving traffic. There's no safe crosswalk. They might have to stop in the middle. And people get hit by cars crossing this area. It is not safe. If the street just was more aesthetically welcoming, more pleasant to walk up and down, that people would be more likely to think of El Cajon Boulevard when they think of going to do their dry cleaning or buy their food or buy their mattresses or take a yoga class. This area is very rich in culture. All it really needs is a little work on infrastructure and funding to make it what it should be. That story was produced by Megan Burks and Brian Myers at our partner Media Arts Center San Diego. It's part of the Speak City Heights project. You can learn more at speakcityheights.org. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us and have a great evening.